Welcome back to Hydro Hack. And in today's episode, I'm going to show you how you can build this. This is a low maintenance outdoor hydroponic gravity fed rain gutter grow veggie garden where I'm growing tomatoes, cucumbers, jalapenos, habaneros, eggplant, capsicums or red bell peppers. I've got a galangal root that's shooting, ginger, and these exotic chilies that used to be in the NFT in the garage. But before we start, I'm long overdue for a proper shout out to Hucho. For those not familiar, Hucho is an Australian YouTuber who produces a lot of quality content in the hydroponics niche. And his content has been extremely helpful to me since I started to dabble in the hydro space myself. Hucho was ultimately the inspiration for this project. So if you like this video or any of my other videos, I totally recommend that you go across and have a look at his stuff. His videos are well thought out and structured, thoroughly researched and pretty professional in general. Whereas I just hack things together as I go along. I don't know him by the way, never met him, don't have any kind of relationship with him. For those of you without background, let me catch you up. About a year ago, I built an NFT hydroponic system in my garage. And over the course of the year, that system has produced tons of mostly basil and Asian greens. I also managed to grow some exotic chili varieties to a fairly advanced stage before we hit winter and everything stopped growing. But all of the details about that are in my last video, so if you're interested, go and check it out. Now, thanks to Hucho, I've taken hydroponics outdoors in a system that his videos showed me how to build. And I'll link in the description a few of his videos that were particularly helpful in this project. Now, before I take you through how I put all of this together, let's jump back three months and have a look what the backyard looked like before all of this started. So this is my backyard. It's a bit overgrown, I need to mow the lawns. Got a deck there, and I've got a little bit of grass down the side here. Lemon tree over in the back corner, and some paved area. So at this stage, the plan is to put maybe four rain gutter grow systems along here. I might put one along the back of the deck here, and I'm thinking two up the back fence here. So that obviously evolved into this. Let me take you through how it works. I have a tank filled with hydroponic nutrients sitting up on the deck and that then gravity feeds down through plumbing into these channels. Each channel needs to be positioned on a level so that it can hold a consistent amount of nutrient down the entire length to act as a reservoir for the plants sitting above it to wick down into and draw up moisture. As the plants use the nutrient and the water in the reservoir, it is refilled by this float valve, which is obviously attached to the tank. Each plant pot has a cotton wick hanging out the bottom, which hangs down into the nutrient. So the cotton wick wicks nutrient up into the medium, which is itself a wicking medium. So moisture wicks throughout the contents of the pot and keeps it at just the right moisture level. As the plants use the moisture, more wicks up into the medium and the float valve refills the reservoir. It's a bit of work to set up, but once set up, it seems to be very low maintenance. Up to this point, I've only been checking in on the garden every weekend because I'm only home on weekends. But you can see everything seems like it's doing just fine. So now that you understand what we're building, let's go through a list of the materials that I used. Now for the grow channels themselves, you'll need some kind of long tube that can be sealed off at both ends and a float valve fitted, etc. It doesn't have to be what I've used, but I've used a 50 by 100 mil PVC downpipe. These come in three meter lengths from Bunnings and they're just good because they're easy to work with. You're going to need a float valve for each channel. Uh, I got this on Amazon. It's got a half inch intake and a thread that you can find plenty of plumbing fittings for. Now for the pots, I use this 400 millimeter poly tube. Uh, that was all I could get at the time, but I would have preferred to get 350 millimeter or even 300 millimeter because the plants seem to be growing just as well in small pots as they are in big pots. And this was verified by Hucho in one of his recent videos. And the main advantage of using smaller pots is you use less medium and medium isn't exactly cheap when you need to fill 49 pots. Now, if you can't get a smaller size polytube, it doesn't really matter if you get a bigger size polytube because 
the next thing we need is one of these, and that is a heat sealer. And using a heat sealer, we can actually make the diameter narrower by sealing along the edge. But we'll get to how we do that later. Uh, this was $35 on Amazon, I think. I'll put the link in the description. Now, you don't have to use bag pots like I do, but it's a lot cheaper than using plastic pots or buckets. Not my idea, by the way. Hucho came up with this, but I reckon it's a great idea and it's working really well. Another thing you'll need is cotton wicking sash. Now this is what runs through the medium in your pot and hangs down into the reservoir of nutrients in the channel underneath. Another fairly key component of this system is the tank that the nutrient solution is stored in, which can then gravity feed down and propagate out into the system. I've gone with this 750 litre soft plastic collapsible aqua tank it seems to be pretty good i bought it on ebay for about 275 i think and then of course you've got all your hoses and plumbing infrastructure that you need in order to be able to connect the tank up to all your channels i've got some snap-on hose fittings and taps just for convenience you could keep it bare bones and just run tubes direct to the float valves but i'm sure there's about a million different ways of doing it You'll obviously need grow medium to fill the pots and plant the seedlings in. In my case, cocoa peat and perlite. And those get mixed at a 60-40 ratio. Another thing you're obviously gonna need is your hydroponic nutrient. I'm not gonna go into hydroponic nutrient in this video. There's tons of videos on YouTube about hydro nutrient. I use the Hucho special recipe of Campbell's Nitro Cal and the Diamond Special Tea at one gram per liter of water. Uh, to get an EC of around 2.4. Now we're gonna jump back in time again and I'm gonna show you how to make the rain gutter grow channels, which is how I got started. Now I made seven of these things and I was gonna show you the first channel I made, but of course I streamlined the process as I went. So instead I'm gonna show you the streamline process. Okay, so I've now put together a few of these rails and I've streamlined the process. You cut out the end to allow yourself room to fold up. So that's 50 mils, which is the depth there, plus however much you want that end bit to stick up above. Then you cut out a shape to allow your float valve. And then again, at the other end, you cut an end out uh, just enough to allow you to fold that end up. And I leave myself a little bit to fold over the edge there. Now, I've made myself this pipe folding template and I'll show you how that works quickly. It just slots down in there and I can hold that upright. Then it's just a matter of heating the plastic up and folding the ends up as neatly as possible. All right, so it's nice and floppy now. sides and push the corners in nice and tight. So there you can see I've got a fairly decent fold um, but it's still not perfect and I'm going to heat up this top bit again and just try and flatten it off against the end of the template. And that way we get it to fold up nice and square. Then I work out where the hole for my float valve should be. I just like to clamp a bit of wooden backing on, onto that before I drill the hole. And that's the float valve end done. Now before I do this end here, I'm going to drill all the holes because once I fold that other end up, it'll be hard to get any rubbish out of the inside of the tube. Now these are the holes that the pots will use to, to wick up from. So I need to either put a grow spike in those holes or hang a wick down into those holes. So I'll mark those out. Now I put the first hole 15 centimetres from the end. Then 38 centimeter intervals. That gives me seven holes along the length of the channel. 
Now with those marked out, I can drill the holes. I put this piece of 4B2 in the pipe just to provide some backing for the drilling in case I go straight through. And then I just go along and drill the holes. Then I use my deburring tool to clean up around the insides of the holes. And once I get these holes tidied up so that I can fit a piece of 25mm PVC pipe in it, uh, then it's time to fold this end closed. I'm just going to empty everything down into there. Now, like I said, this is the time to empty all of the plastic filings out before we fold the ends up and they get trapped. And that's my end all folded up. You can see I've folded a little bit of a lip back over the top to seal up that gap at the end. And I've just cut those folds off at the top level with the top of the downpipe. And that's the last rail done. Now the float valve has this screw adjustment so you can adjust the level. Um, so I'm not gonna worry about that right now. I'm just gonna poke it through the hole so that it points downwards and screw the back on. And when we plumb that in, we can see how full it fills and we can adjust that float height if necessary. Now, once you've got your rails all made, you need to lay them out on a level surface. Obviously they have to sit flat so that the water level stays constant along the whole bottom of the rail. Now, the way I've achieved this is with these uh, structural pine 4B2 battens, which I have screwed into four of these cross battens. So there's four up the length, another one there, another one there, and another one there. That way, all I need to do is put padding under an end like I have over here uh, until I get the whole thing level. That just means I don't have to worry about leveling off the, the ground. I just have to prop up both ends. One thing to be aware of is that as the plants grow and the load on these rails gets heavier, um, they do start to sag in the middle, but that can easily be fixed just by putting some extra padding under one of these middle battens and that seems to have fixed it for me. I won't go through how to put these wooden battens together. It's just cutting wood and screwing it together. Now being untreated structural pine, I am aware that they are going to deteriorate over time, uh, but we'll just see what that looks like. Maybe I'll apply a coat of deck oil next year if they start to look a bit worse for wear. Now I'll take you through how I make the pots. So work out how, how deep you want your pot. I make mine about 40 centimeters, but I don't think they actually need to be that deep. You can make it as deep as you want and obviously then cut wherever. The first step is obviously to seal off one side. Uh, this is where the heat sealer comes in. So you can see that's now sealed along the bottom. And theoretically you could stop there. You've got a bag with the sealed bottom. Um, and that's what Hucho does, and he does some kind of complex folding to kind of get a nice kind of square base, but I find that really fiddly, so I do a couple more seals so I can get a nice square base. So I mark in one quarter of that distance in from this side, and one quarter in from this side. Right, what that does is it gives me one, two, three, four, four even sides, uh, which obviously makes up the base of the square. Then I get in there and open it up and fold it into 
a corner like that. Make sure the crease on the back lines up with the seal on the bottom. You can see our mark there, that's the line we want to seal across. Line it up in the sealer, it doesn't have to be dead straight or anything like that. And And then you can cut off these corners just along the edge of the seal. And then we can turn the whole thing inside out, push the corners out. And what we have there is a square base with no fiddly folding on the inside of the pot. And that's the pot basically done. Now this is a pot that I prepared earlier and I wanted it smaller so, it, so I just sealed down one edge to reduce the diameter of the poly tube. You can see the smaller pot definitely on the right here. Obviously you can make these pots as big or as small as you want depending on the poly tube you have. So in that pot we just made I'm going to put in a new tomato seedling to replace this tomato which died a couple of weeks back. I probably could have replaced it in the same pot, but I don't know why this one died and I want to take a bit of time to figure out why later. And it's just easier to put the new seedling in a new pot. Assuming I don't find evidence of any kind of disease, I should be able to reuse that medium and that pot for something in the future. So I'm going to plant this replacement tomato in a slightly smaller pot. And if we were using grow spikes, this pot would be done and ready. I'm not using grow spikes, so I need to poke a wick up into the bottom of the pot so that I can fill the medium in around it. So even though I'm mostly not using grow spikes, I'm gonna talk a little bit about them just because they can be convenient and Hucho seems to like grow spikes. So this is my take on a easy homemade grow spike. And basically it has my cotton wicking sash running up through the center, through a couple of holes, down the other side and back through. So I've got four bits of wick hanging down. And the principle is basically this, this spike sticks up from the rail. The wick all hangs down into the nutrient solution. And then you just drop the pot onto it like this. The spike pokes up through the plastic in the bottom of the pot and forces those wicks up into the grow medium. Now in its past life, this spike used to be a 25 mil piece of PVC pipe, but uh, I think they're 200 mil lengths. And if you cut those the right way, you can get two spikes out of those. So I can see how grow spikes are convenient, but I just reckon they're a little bit more effort than they're worth. So I use my custom made poking tool and I just get a piece of wick, stick that into the little groove and then I poke it into the bottom of the middle of the pot. In here, I'll just unhook that sash, pull the poking tool through, and I've got a wick hanging out the bottom of the pot. I've got plenty of wick inside to run up through the medium. So now as I fill this pot with medium, I'll just hold this up and fill around it. All right, so the medium I'm using is a 60-40 Cocoa Peat Perlite mix. It's a classic Hucho recipe, and I'm just going to hold that wick up while I bucket some of that in there. You can see I'm filling around it and it's still poking up. Right, so there I have a full pot full of medium. I think that was about seven liters. And you can see I've got my wick hanging out at the bottom and that extends up all the way into probably halfway up the pot. Now I'll whack one of these tomato seedlings into a hole in the middle and that's ready to go out into the garden.
And there's my replacement seedling. It's looking a bit anemic. It's been in the propagator for far too long. Hopefully it bounces back pretty quickly and catches up with the, the rest of these. So now I've been through how to make the channels and how the wicking pots work. Um, I've been through the supports. I've touched on nutrient and grow medium. That's basically everything you need to know to be able to implement this yourself. Obviously there are other considerations like some of your plants may need supports. These cucumbers are being trained up through these wires on the fence and I'm training the tomatoes up these strings which are just poking out from the top of the fence. I've also put together some frames like this and same for the tomatoes and cucumbers over there. But that's just gardening. There's always going to be some maintenance to be done and as far as gardens go, this one is pretty low maintenance. Now let's just go through how the garden is actually performing. So everything down this back fence you can see was planted 11 weeks ago. In 11 weeks you can see a number of the tomatoes have grown pretty much up to the top of the fence. That's one particular variety. The other variety doesn't seem to be as tall, but they have been focused on fruit production. And if we just look down here, we're bursting with tomatoes at the lower level and we've got another round coming through a couple of levels up and we've got plenty more flowers. The taller tomatoes are a little bit behind in terms of fruit production, but you can see this one's bursting with tomatoes. They're a bit smaller. Um, that's at the first level. And then we've got another few coming up in the second level. And then we've got more flowers going all the way up to the fence. Now, one issue I'm having down this far end of the fence is the cucumbers. The cucumbers down this end are much smaller. That's the smallest one there, but that one's not much bigger. And that one's a little bit bigger again but still nothing like these ones down this end which are going nuts and using up every available piece of sunlight. Now I'm pretty sure the reason for the discrepancy is that this end gets a lot less hours of sunlight. Everything along this fence is in shadow for most of the morning then the sun comes over uh, it gets a few hours of sunlight and then the shadow from the house comes across and it hits that back corner first. That's really the only thing I can see that's different about that end versus this end. Interestingly, the tomatoes down that end, while they're just slightly behind those up this end, they're still growing fine and they're starting to get fruit. Down this end they're doing fine and we're getting lots of cucumbers growing, uh, lots of flowers as well. Now, everything else in the garden has been in for seven and a half weeks, except for these magnificent chilies, which started off in the garage NFT. So they're much more progressed than everything else. So the tomatoes and cucumbers along here uh, are nowhere near as progressed as the ones along the back fence. Obviously they haven't been in as long, but I also feel that they've been getting battered a lot more by the wind here. And I think it's impacting their development a little bit. But we've got tomatoes growing on all of the tomato plants. And the cucumbers have been quite productive as well. They're Lebanese cucumbers, so I wouldn't expect them to get much bigger than that. The capsicums along here have been getting quite wind battered, but they're growing nicely and they're starting to get quite a few flowers. This eggplant's going great. I actually didn't really intend to plant eggplant, but I ended up with a seedling there and I just whacked it in. It's getting some flowers on the inside there as well. Looks like it might have also had some aphids, but they appear to be dead now. Now along here we've got jalapenos and habaneros, and this is probably the most wind-battered section of the backyard. The leaves are looking a little bit worse for wear on some of these, but they actually are all growing quite well, so we'll see what happens with those. This cucumber is also a bit stunted and I wonder if it's because of the wind. Now the ginger experiment is quite interesting. These ones here were planted about four weeks earlier than these ones. These ones I planted in trays and let them start shooting before I transplanted them into the bags. These ones I just got big chunks of ginger and stuck them straight into the bags without any kind of pre-preparation. What I'm finding is the ginger that was planted earlier and was propagated in trays before moving into the bags is not doing as well as the bigger chunks of ginger that was just stuck straight into the bags. Now these were planted weeks later uh, they didn't start shooting for a long time after they went into the bag, but when they did start to shoot, they've come up quite thick and strong. But this is still just an experiment. Ginger would typically grow in warmer climates than Melbourne, and it yet remains to be seen whether we can harvest a good crop of ginger roots when the season wraps up. 
Now, just like the ginger, I'm also doing an experiment with Gallangal, and this guy really seems to be struggling to get started. You can see it's significantly behind the ginger, but I'll let it run its course and we'll see how it goes. Now, I wasn't sure how these former NFT chilies would transplant into a bagged pot system like this, but they seem to be thriving out here, especially these two on the end. They're just going nuts. We got plenty of fruit off them while they were in the NFT, but we couldn't grow full-size fruit. So hopefully this year out here, we'll get some full-size chilies. So it's fair to say that 11 weeks in over here and seven and a half weeks in over here, I have to say I'm pretty impressed with the performance so far. Now it just remains to be seen whether we can actually harvest good crops of delicious tomatoes, as well as more cucumbers, jalapenos, habaneros, capsicum, and ginger. If you're keen to see how it all turns out, subscribe to my channel. And of course, throw me a thumbs up if you like this video. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Hydroponics.